Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, some of us have forgotten that political debates are not over when everything has been said, but only when everyone has said it, most recently, uh, Gordon MacDonald. However, I hope to avoid that particular uh, trap. Um, it's perhaps worth going way back to where tribunals actually came from. They came from the Tribuni Plebis, uh, which followed a, a, a battle in 494 BC uh, when the legionnaires refused to go out and fight for Rome. And to buy them off, the plebs were given the right to elect plebeian tribunes. Uh, and the tribunes uh, were made sacrosanct while they held in office. Um, the tribune was the principal and guarantor of the civil liberties of the Roman citizens against arbitrary state power. And I think that's a pretty good basis for uh, what tribunals are. Um, Willie Coffey uh, talked about the rights of the public, so zooming, zooming forward a couple of thousands of years to the College of Justice Act 1532, um, which reads, and there are persons to be sworn to minister justice equally to all persons in such causes as shall happen to come before them with such other rules and statutes as shall please the king. Okay, up to that point, as shall please the king. But that's the way the constitution worked in those days. So a lot of what we're discussing today, it just ain't new. We've looked at it uh, many times uh, over the hundreds of years. Of course, in the 1600s, we had a considerable debate about the divine right of kings or the power of the people. And in an attempt to reassert the divine uh, right of kings, the Crown Appointments Act of 1661 declared that it is an inherent privilege of the Crown to have sole choice and appointment of the officers of Parliament, privy councillors, and the nominations of the Lords of the Sessions. Fortunately, we've moved on from that. Um, the spice brief... I, I'm going to try and fill my six... Christine uh, Graham, briefly. just because I, I was not aware, I think I may blunder here, but the divine right of kings pertained to the Scottish kings, that that was an English concept and that Scottish kings were there by leave of the Scottish people from the declaration of our broth. I see Lewis MacDonald's nodding, so I have an ally. Um, Stuart Stevenson. Well, I'll simply remind uh, the member that was uh, the Sixth Act of 1661 by the Estates of the Scots Parliament. So I think th things are probably not quite so clear-cut as the member uh, suggests. They certainly tried. Did they succeed? A debate for another day. Um, Spice's briefing draws our attention to concerns about whether tribunals' lack of independence from government, perceived or otherwise, is in contradiction of Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And I think the legislation that we are looking at uh, uh, today and that we'll be looking at in uh, time to come is going to be an opportunity to set a uh, pretty rigid uh, statement uh, that uh, they, they are independent. Turning to some of the things that are actually in uh, the bill that's before us, uh, I really made uh, reference uh, uh, on the back of uh, Rod Campbell's comments uh, about uh, the upholding of independence of the members of Scottish tribunals and the duty that's placed on members of the Scottish Parliament. This is quite an interesting one because the bill doesn't directly prescribe uh, what happens if a member or members collectively of the Scottish Parliament fail to uphold that. I suspect that the Code of Conduct to the Parliament at 3.13 may cover it where members uh, are required, uh, should uphold the law. But I suspect there is uh, ambiguity uh, perhaps there that uh, committee and Parliament may continue uh, to look at. Now, of course, the whole issue uh, of tribunals is not one uh, that we've not fa failed to look at before. Reference was made uh, by Willie Coffey to David McClatchy. Well, there was a debate that David McClatchy led in March 2004, uh, which was on the Fraser Inquiry. And one of the issues the Fraser Inquiry had was that it was unable to get access to the powers that would have been available had it been a Westminster Inquiry uh, under the Tribunals of Inquiry Evidence Act, 
whereby they could have been given the power to command witnesses to appear before them and to bring the necessary evidence. So we've, we've kind of been there, and I think we've perhaps overlooked that there are some significant potential uh, effects in our not having uh, all the powers that we might, uh, we might seek. When I, as a minister, took through uh, the Long Leases Act uh, through Parliament, uh, in the stage one uh, debate on that, uh, I had to refer to tribunals as well, uh, because tribunals, of course, are an important part of judging the value of land, and that was central uh, to part of the debate uh, on that particular uh, subject. Um, it's perhaps, uh, as the time approaches where I may, should wind up, I I'll just say a little bit about mental health tribunals. They are very special. Um, they're different in the very distinct sense that they're about the deprivation of liberty of a citizen, which is quite unusual for a, uh, for, for a tribunal, albeit it is in the interests of the citizen that that be undertaken. So I certainly would want to see that we do protect uh, the right of the citizen. Um, this... Uh, is it for me an interesting speech because it's my 500th that I've made here, so it's a special round number, and it feels like many more the convener is, is, is saying. But let me, let me just close, convener, by uh, quoting from the College of Justice Act of 1532, uh, which says that we intend to institute a college of cunning and wise men. That might be the kind of people we want involved uh, in, our, uh, in our tribunals. And that the persons be sworn to minister justice to all persons in such causes as shall happen to come before them. And let's extend it uh, to women in this modern age as well, as the minister has urged me to do, presiding officer.